Let's talk about the greatest late medieval helmet. And it's not this one. Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria. Now, I've spoken quite a bit about helmets in the past, and I've spoken specifically about the sallet quite a bit. Now, you will notice that the sallet here protects the top part of the head, and the bottom part would be pre protected by a bever. This makes it incredibly versatile. But the helmet that we're talking about today isn't the sallet. It's a whole different type of helmet for a whole different purpose with a whole different range of advantages. And I'm considering getting one. In fact, I've been considering getting one for a very long time. And I'm going to explain why I need one. <laughs> I really need it. Why I need one in this video. And it is the Great Bassinet, also known as the Grand Bassinet. The Great Bassinet or Grand Bassinet is a very different helmet solution to the sallet. And it's not to undermine the advantages of the sallet. The sallet is an absolutely fantastic and incredibly versatile. And I want you to uh, fixate on that word for a second. This is an incredibly versatile helmet. And you could argue that the Grand Bassinet or Great Bassinet is not particularly versatile in some ways. That's why during its life, uh, it was preferred for certain uses and it continued in certain uses after it kind of on the battlefield went more or less out of fashion. It continued in use for specific uses which I'm going to spoil you here, is basically tournament fighting, but we'll look more at that in a second. The Sallet was far more versatile on the battlefield, the Grand or Great Bassinet, far more versatile in other, uh, in other tournament senses, for example, but it was nevertheless incredibly popular in the early 15th century. And we're going to look at why, and we're going to look at some examples. But before we dive into that, a very quick word from our sponsors for this video. So it's winter time, it's cold and wet outside. You want to snuggle up with a little game on your phone. In fact, it's a free game that you can also play on PC with over 800 champions. A game with amazing PC quality graphics with orcs and dwarves and elves. And this is a game that you can download for free right now, either with the link down there or the QR code on screen. This is a game with brutal, boss battles, dungeons, and arena battles. Well, this game is Raid Shadow Legends. And as it's winter and it's icy outside, we've got some amazing icy, wintry characters for you to play. First up is Sir Nicholas. He's a void level legendary champion. Not only can he hit hard and do a lot of damage, but he's also got powerful shields. And in the dwarves, we've got the legendary champion Tormund the Cold. Not only has he got the aura skill, but he's absolutely awesome in the arena. And in the Knight's Revenant, we've got the awesome Whirling Frost King. With amazing defense and strength buffs, and also the ability to use things like Veil. So absolutely epic news for Raid, and that is the Cursed City, which is the biggest update since the Doom Tower. The Cursed City has over a hundred different stages to take part in, and even they've combined two clan bosses so that you have to take down two clan bosses at the same time. And not to miss out on any festive joy, there's a Christmas story on Raid, where you can follow Sir Nicholas himself through his own festive story. It comes with mini games to solve, and you can win both in-game and real-world prizes, ranging from epic and legendary champions to actual Amazon gift cards. All you need to do to join is head over to RaidXmas.com. There are also all sorts of themed events, tournaments, summon boosts, and other surprises with a month-long Yuletide Titan event where you can earn awesome in-game rewards. So what are you waiting for? Head over, download Raid right now, get playing and settle down in Teleria for your Yuletide fun. If you're new to the game then you can get downloading the game for free right now using the link below or scan the QR code on screen and you are going to get two epic champions rather than one this time. The first is Lightsworn, an epic champion from the Sacred Order and the next is the epic champion Juliana who's incredibly powerful in attack using magic. Once you're in game and crushing your enemies, then maybe you can come and find me under the name Captain Context. And if you're quick enough, you can even join my clan. So hit that free download link below or the QR code on screen, and I'll see you in game. So thanks for sticking with me. Now back to the main topic of this video. So, not to undermine salads, they are fantastic. This was the main or one of the most popular battlefield helmets in the second half of the 15th century, so between 1450 and 1500, and in fact continued to be popular after 1500. So, what is a great bassinet? Well, people like Ian Laspina, um, Knight Errant, have done fantastic and in-depth videos on the origin of the great bassinet. So I'm gonna come at this from a slightly more personal point of view. 
So I am looking at getting a new armor. Now I dabble in the world of uh, Wars of the Roses reenactment, as many of you know, and many of you will have seen pictures of me in my blackened armor with my matching salad. Now I actually own a couple of other salads as well, that being another example by Peter Polyak there. Um, but salads are fantastic and they are great for reenactment, they're great for um, representing people in battle and they were probably the most popular type of helmet in the second half of the 15th century all over Europe um, and they are great helmets. However, they have some deficiencies. So one of the things that I uh, do in armour and aim to do more of in armour is what a lot of people refer to as harness fecton. I'm actually not a huge fan of that term because it's very German and I personally don't focus on German treaties as I focus on Italian, uh, French um, and other things. Okay, so um, I do do a bit of German as well, but it isn't my main focus. But harness fechten essentially means fighting in armour. Harness is armour, fechten, fighting. Um, and uh, fundamentally, the problem with doing this in a HEMA context is unlike reenactment, where you're deliberately not aiming at certain areas, you don't aim at the face. Uh, in Bohurt, for example, they're not allowed to thrust. In HEMA, what we're trying to do is trying to use some of the techniques that we can see in the treatises. That means half sorting, that means thrusting into gaps, that means thrusting at faces, that means hitting faces. So the problem is we need armour that protects us adequately. Yes, okay, we can use safe weapons, you might use nylon, you might use wood, or you might use flexible blunted steel with a safety tip on the end. We might use safer weapons, but fundamentally, you still need to be protected well enough in those places. And one of the big places that's pertinent to this video is the face, okay? Now, the problem with a salad and a bever is they have the um, accidental ability to open up in the middle. Now, in war, in real medieval campaigning, that's a great benefit because at, at a moment's notice, you're out of breath, you need to quickly take water, you've only got a split second, or you just need to get a better view of the battlefield or um, where, the, uh, where, the enemies, um, where the enemy are before you send your troops over there. You can pull your visor up or you can pull, push your uh, tilt, your salad back on, on the head. I'll just demonstrate that. So even if you've got a fixed visor, you, you can actually tilt the thing up like that really quickly and easily and see around. Um, and so it's a bit like a cross between a kettle hat, kettle helmet as it's sometimes known, or chapeau de fur, um, and a visored helmet. The disadvantage in a HEMA context is very clearly if we're using pole axes, long swords and daggers to stab at each other's faces, you're going to get stabbed in the face by accident. Now, there are some, some ways around this. You can get salads where the bever is attached to the side pivots at the side of the uh, top of the helmet. The problem is the historical examples of those are rather limited. The ones in English art and Flemish art are conjectural. The ones in German art, in fact, we've got German surviving examples. I think there's one by Lawrence Helsch Helschmid. In fact, there might be a couple. Um, they are German and they are very late. Um, but they are a good solution and some people do that. So some people fix the bever to the salad to get over that issue. Uh, another way is to strap your salad so the chin strap goes over the bever and underneath. And I've looked at that in previous videos. I've done a dedicated video on that. So there, there are ways around it. However, in period, if we look at the uh, 15th century, if we look at things like the uh, Beach and Pageant uh, manuscript in the British Library, or indeed we look at the tournament armours uh, for Henry VIII even if we go into the early uh, yeah, beginning of the 16th century, a solution they go for is the Great Bassinet. So, in a nutshell, what's the Great Bassinet? The Great Bassinet is a development of the bassinet. So a lot of you will have seen those snout-faced, uh, pointy-faced, as they're some call, sometimes called um, hound skull uh, bassinets. Essentially it's a development of that whereby the male aventail, so you've got male with padding underneath, thick padding underneath, uh, which is what gives it its cone-like, quite stiff-looking shape, um, the aventail of male was replaced by plate. And as I say, check out um, uh, Knight Errant in Lespina's channel because he's got a lot more detail on how that happened. Essentially, they started adding uh, gorget plates at the front. Uh, those developed, they added a plate at the back and eventually you end up with a full headpiece that comes down and sits on the shoulders. So, fundamentally, they are great tournament helmets and I would argue one of the best in terms of most protective helmets devised in the medieval period 
end of. And I think it's great testament to the fact that when we look at the armours in the Tudor period, so the 16th century, that were devised for fighting with longsword and poleaxe on foot, some of the most in, like dangerous styles of uh, competitive fighting they did in armour, then much of the time they went to a great bassinet. Sometimes they went to a close helmet or an armet, which is another option if you wear it with a wrapper, but a lot of the time they went with a great bassinet. And if we look, as I say, if we look at the uh, Beach and Pageant manuscript, then indeed we can see when they're fighting on foot with pole axes, despite the fact by that date, so around 1480, the Great Bassinet had kind of been more or less phased out of use on the battlefield. I'm sure there were some still around, but by and large, they weren't being worn much on the battlefield anymore. But you do see them absolutely used in tournaments, both on foot with pole axes and swords and on horseback when they're using the club, the Kolben for the Kolben Tournier, as the Germans call it, the club tournament, or blunted swords, also seen in René d'Anjou's tournament book, where you can see them fighting with both blunt swords and clubs on horseback. And they wear brigandine for flexibility on their torsos and a sport version of the Great Bassinet on their head with a grill. So I think something worth considering that's interesting as well is the Great Bassinet in war. So one of the great questions about the Great Bassinet is why was it so popular and so beloved, particularly of the English and French and the Spanish uh, and Portuguese as well actually, so the Iberians, the um, English, the French and to some degree the Flemish as well. Why was it so popular in the early 15th century, whereas by the time we get to the middle of the 15th century, everyone on the battlefield is pretty much switching to the salad and the bever. And this is one of those great unanswered questions of um, armour studies. And I don't have an answer for you because I don't think there is an easy answer. This is something that I think a, a group of experts, maybe we could do this as a collaborative video in the future, could get around a table and have a chat about this. I think it's very, very interesting because if we look at the late 14th century, we see people wearing bassinets that have been, they've been wearing for, for more than 50 years, 60, 70 years, they've been wearing bassinets with male aventels. And this is a great combination because it's very good head protection, very good face protection, and you can move the neck around. Okay, you've got great neck mobility that you can move around like a gimbal um, because of, you've got mail and padding around your neck, not plate. Now what's interesting is at the end of the 14th century, so in the 1390s, we start to see the development of the Great Bassinet, and this was the typical helmet for the best armoured people at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, um, or the Battle of Vernoy in the 1420s, uh, and all the way through the 1430s. And it wasn't really until the 1440s that we start to see the appearance of um, salads. So the question is, why did they go from a helmet which had great neck mobility to a helmet which has no neck mobility. You can turn the head a little bit inside, but you're a bit like the original uh, Tim Burton Batman film. You're like this, okay? And you can see that with Ian Lespina's videos where he's got the great bassinet or photos of him. To look around, you have to turn your entire body because the, the helmet, the great bassinet, basically plugs onto the top of your cuirass and is, in many cases, uh, buckled to it, okay? Usually at the back to stop it falling forwards, but later on at the front as well and it sits on your shoulders to some extent. So you don't have, you have terrible neck mobility, but obviously that comes with a benefit. The benefit is protection of your neck, both in terms of impact, so whether it's hit by a lance, if you look at jousting helmets, uh, frog mouth helms, they're much the same. Uh, so protection from impact from the front, protection impact from the side, from a pole axe hit, for example, if someone smacks you with the pole axe, instead of your head going crunch and breaking your neck, um, instead, your entire body is able to take the force because the helmet sits on the top of the shoulders. Um, so it's great from impact and also against arrows because if people are shooting arrows and crossbow bolts at you, far better having a big neck plate defense than having mail where arrow points and bolts can get stuck in and on a good day penetrate as we saw in Todd's uh, arrows versus armor tests. So great bassinet, amazing level of protection, probably the best in the whole medieval period but at the cost of weight and mobility. So the question is, why did they go from having a nice flexible neck to having a completely stiff neck between about 1395 and about 1445, so for about 50 years at the beginning of the 15th century, to then going back to having a more mobile bever and salad? Is it simply that the bever and salad offers still a very good level of protection of the neck and the face and the head? similar or better than the earlier male aventail, 
not as good as a great bassinet, but still very good, certainly frontally, um, at the, but with the benefit of being able to open up very quickly and giving you more head movement. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe it's as simple as that. Or maybe it was that warfare had changed somewhat. Now, there were various different types of great bassinet, and they went through variations across time and also by geography, by location as well. So uh, speaking simply as a kind of overview, what we find is if we just look at the visors for a second, we find that initially the visors look very much like we find on earlier hound skull or pig faced bassinets. So pointy nose uh, with two little slits for the eyes and lots of perforation, sometimes on one side, sometimes on both uh, for breaths, but also they um, add to vision greatly as well. Actually, it's one of the reasons that makes them so good for fighting on foot. Um, and then later on, what we start to see is we start to see sometimes um, the more, well, in fact, pretty much always, the, the, the snout gets more rounded um, and the holes become sometimes slots. And sometimes the vision slots also start to vary as well. Sometimes we get multiple ones. Sometimes we get holes above the so-called vision slots. So we get greater visibility, slightly less protection against something like arrows, for example. Um, you know, there's always the potential for compromising the visor there, but fundamentally it gives you more, breathe, more breathing um, ease and more vision. Also more uh, hearing as well, um, but primarily vision. Okay, you've got way more vision with lots more perforations. And so we start to see the uh, visors get more rounded. But one of the things that's quite notable is as we go later in the 15th century, we start to see the holes more often become slots. Now it's interesting, if we look at something like the Beach and Pageant manuscript, we can actually see holes alongside slots. So the two things were certainly uh, in vogue at the same time. My hunch is that the slots are more of a tournament thing. They are better for vision, but obviously they wouldn't be so good on a battlefield because they would be more easy to allow blades and, and, and arrow points in. Um, so I think the holes are probably more of a military style that was nevertheless used in tournaments, whereas the slots, I think, are something to aid vision and breathing, which are more of a tournament thing. And of course, the ultimate evolution of that are the grills that we see on the Colburn Tournier um, uh, Club Tournament and Blunt Sword Tournament, um, the great bassinets that we find all over Germany, but also we find them in uh, René Donjou's tournament book as well. So France, um, um, you find them in England, you see them in heraldic devices and so on and so forth. They were common all over Europe. Um, and that type of grill is, although you might occasionally see it in art used in a battle, I think that's probably an artistic thing. By and large, it's, it's just a tournament thing to be used with specific type of weapons. It wouldn't offer practically no protection against things like arrows or thrown weapons. Um, so it's maximum visibility, maximum breathing. So I think that's the natural evolution of slots rather than holes. But in terms of the actual shape of the bassinet as well, if we ignore the visor now, and some of the visors are removable, they have pins in the like earlier bassinets, so you can put a jousting visor on or a foot combat visor or whatever, have a bunch of possibly even a war visor. Um, the actual bassinet itself, one of the tendencies we start to see is earlier ones are put on like a great helm. So they're like a bucket that you put down on your head. So they're quite broad around the neck here because you have to be able to fit your head through that hole. Later versions from about the 14, 20s and 30s onwards start to get a more scooped in look underneath the chin. Now this is particularly the case with the so-called bicock helmet, which is actually a form of armet really in Germany. But certain types of great bassinet also follow this scooped in throat. Um, and this becomes more and more the case the later we go. Now to achieve that, because you can't fit your head through that narrow neck hole, what actually happens is there's a pivot point here whereby the front of the helmet opens up, a bit like a later close helmet. That's probably where the close helmet got the idea from, although some people will argue it's from the sallets which have the bever attached to the sallet. But anyway, maybe it's both, probably it's both. So you put your uh, helmet down, your great bassinet down here, then you lock this in here. There's usually a turning pin at the side, which we can see on some of the surviving originals, and then your visor can open and close here. And this achieves a much closer into the neck fit. Um, does that have any particular advantages? Um, I, I think it just looks better. Uh, possibly it makes you a slightly smaller target, more of a glancing surface maybe. I think by and large it's more of a look thing than necessarily a practicality thing. Um, but it does make it very difficult, and this is an important note if you're looking at medieval and early Renaissance art, it does make it very difficult in art very often to tell whether something is one of these great bassinets with, with quite a close neck or whether it's an armet or an early close helmet, because in silhouette, in outline, they can all look very, very similar. 
And I think that's actually partly answering the question. It's that they, they had a certain shape in mind that they wanted to achieve that looked more like the human form. And as Toby Capwell has said in a lot of his um, lectures, you know, adhering to the human form and natural forms was something that they thought was godly and good at that time. And I think this was partly it. I think they wanted people to look as humanoid as possible and as least like a sort of weird abstract shape. Um, and so I think it's no coincidence that armets, close helmets and great bassinets achieve a similar overall silhouette, even if they put on differently, constructed differently and have different strengths and weaknesses. As we go into the 16th century, there are further changes to the visor. There's sometimes the visors achieve forms we didn't really see very much until maybe the 1490s uh, and into the 1500s these kind of almost like bellowed type visors that we later associate with um, with certain German armors start to become more popular and some of Henry VIII's armors but earlier styles of great bassinet retained in use and again if we look at the Beecham pageant we can see earlier styles of great bassinet being used alongside later styles probably great bassinets that may be dated from the 1450s alongside great bassinets that dated to the 1480s because a great bassinet is a great bassinet and at least one of the great bassinets worn by Henry VIII was probably an earlier one that had been um, updated and reused and this happens a lot in medieval um, uh, armouring is that helmets from an earlier period are sometimes recycled and reused and modified, bits changed and bits added to them to make them more up-to-date and usable, fashionable let's say, in the modern world, whatever period that, that was. Um, and you know little things as well as we get into the 16th century we start to see a kind of crest or comb on the top of the um, skull of the helmet and things like this. So there are things, there are things you can look at uh, the, uh, with great bassinets to differentiate whether something dates to 1480 or 1510 there are little stylistic changes that happen to them. A last note I want to point out is that you will notice a correlation between the great bassinet used by people who fight on foot particularly by Polacks and longsword fighters on foot and also the fact that the English and the French loved this type of helmet at a time when they were predominantly or very largely fighting against each other on foot. Um, now, not to say that you can't wear these on horseback, and in fact they are shown worn on horseback in lots of art, but I know people that joust competitively, and only a very few of them use great bassinets. Most people who joust prefer the uh, frog mouth, or they prefer an armet, or something like this. Not many people like the great bassinet for mounted work, and if we look at history, people when this period when the great bassinet was incredibly popular was predominantly worn by people fighting on foot, and then if we look at the 16th century, we look at the survival of the great bassinet. Was it used in jousting? No, the frog mouth was predominantly used in jousting, or the armet and the close helmet. The, the great bassinet survived for fighting on foot with poleaxe and longsword. Um, so I think that tells us that that's where it's best suited. So why do I personally want one? Well, quite simply, because I'm a HEMA person, okay? If I was doing Bohurt, if I was doing pure reenactment, uh, you know, for pure reenactment, a salad's probably the best. It's the most comfortable, it's the lysest, it's the easiest to get on and off, you can open it up. It doesn't matter if you've got an open face because no one's actually shooting arrows at you uh, and no one's actually going to hit you really hard in the head with a poleaxe, at least in the reenactment that I do. Whereas in a HEMA context, if someone's going to be hitting me hard in the head with a poleaxe and thrusting my face, I want a great bassinet for the protection of my neck and the protection of my face. Uh, so there we go. Um, I'm currently looking at uh, great bassinet designs on my Pinterest. I've actually created a uh, board just for evidence for English great bassinets. In fact, a lot of English great bassinets look almost identical to the, the French and Flemish ones as far as I can see. And I think in many cases they were imported. So in many cases, the great bassinets you got in England were probably made in Flanders. Um, and so there's a lot of crossover, but nevertheless, I'm trying to, because the armor that my new armor is being based on is shown with a salad. So I'm clearly gonna get a salad that matches that armor, but I also want a helmet for HEMA fighting and I need a great bassinet, I need one. Uh, so I'm having to do the research to decide on the final design of that great bassinet so that it looks plausible with the English armor of circa 1470 that I'm getting replicated. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Maybe you didn't know about the great bassinet or grand bassinet before. Um, do you own one? Uh, what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of them? Would you like one? Do you hate them? 
any other interesting comments you want to put below. Are there other particular bits of armor? Maybe you'd like me to do a dedicated video on pauldrons or polanes. I don't know. Gauntlets, maybe. There's a lot to be said about gauntlets, actually. I've done a lot of research on those. But anyway, uh, any particular questions you've got, feel free to post down below. And thanks once again to Raid for sponsoring this video. Remember, you can check out that free download link below or QR code on screen. And you'll get those insane bonuses and two epic champions. Thanks again for watching. I have been Matt Easton. I will continue to be. And I uh, hope I'll see you back on the channel really, really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.